Aurora. At this stage, I can offer nothing more than my word. I am a senior government employee in the intelligence community. I hope you understand that contacting you is extremely high risk. For now, know that every border you cross, every purchase you make, every call you dial, every cell phone tower you pass, friend you keep, site you visit, and the subject line you type is in the hands of a system whose reach is unlimited, but whose safeguards are not. In the end, if you publish the source material, I will likely be immediately implicated. I ask only that you ensure this information makes it home to the American public. Thank you, and be careful. Citizen 4. Sorry, I don't know anything about you. Okay, um, I work for... Uh... Sorry, I don't know your name. Oh, sorry. I, uh, my name is Edward Snowden. Uh, I go by Ed. Um, Edward Joseph Snowden's the full name. fascinating subject. It is challenging, it is critical, it's complex and it's contested the world over. It made almost no headlines, and yet a major piece of legislation was quietly signed into law a little over a week ago. President Obama signed a bill that allows the U.S. government to combat foreign propaganda by creating its own. Let's take a look and give it a reality check. Well, a little over a week ago, President Obama quietly signed into law the 2017 National Defense Authorization Act. But so often, there are additional laws and spending bills tucked into the NDAA, and this year was no exception. This time, it was something called the Countering Foreign Propaganda and Disinformation Act of 2016. Oh yes, this bill, which was on the Senate side, sponsored by Ohio Senator Rob Portman, is designed to combat what is called foreign propaganda from organizations such as RT. While all of that stuff has been publicized, there's another amendment out there that almost slipped by under the radar. Introduced by Representatives Adam Smith and Mac Thornberry, bipartisan team, the amendment aims to strike down a ban on the dissemination of propaganda by the State Department and the Broadcasting Board of Governors on domestic audiences. 
Now, some say this is creeping fascism. Others try to claim that it offers transparency. So joining me to discuss it is Michael Hastings, a Rolling Stone contributing editor and author of the new book, The Operators, the wild and terrifying inside story of America's war in Afghanistan. Michael, thanks for coming back on the show tonight. Hey, how's it going? It's going well, but I'm curious to hear, uh, you know, what you have to say on this. You're the first one that did the story. You got the scoop. Obviously, you thought it was important enough to write about. I got this story because there were people within Congress, people within the Pentagon, and, and people outside, uh, you know, hu human rights activists, who, that this amendment raised some serious red flags. Primarily, why does the State Department and other government agencies need less restrictions in the terms of the material or propaganda that can be produced and distributed in the U.S.? On December 23rd, a Friday, the day before Christmas Eve and the entire Christmas holiday, when he absolutely knew that nobody in the world was going to be paying attention to anything that he did, President Obama signed the National Defense Authorization Act. Now, that in and of itself is nothing special. It's something that happens pretty much every single year. It is the budget that funds the United States military, so you know it's something Republicans are not gonna just let go under the radar. Here's the thing about the NDAA that President Obama signed last Friday that nobody paid attention to. It specifically outlines in this legislation a, a program for the federal government to create in is section 1287, the Global Engagement Center. Well, there is now. That bipartisan bill will establish an interagency center housed at the State Department to coordinate and synchronize counter propaganda efforts throughout the U.S. government. The bill also creates a grant program for NGOs, for think tanks, civil society, and other experts outside government who are, quote, engaged in counter propaganda related work. But what this organization is going to do is fight foreign propaganda in the United States. They do not outline what constitutes as foreign propaganda, and it doesn't say that the propaganda has to be specifically aimed at interfering with the, the United States in general, just get rid of foreign propaganda. And how are they gonna do this? Well, according to section 1287, they're gonna help give out grants to social and independent media outlets whose job it will be to refute the propaganda. Essentially, the government is going to hand out cash. Now, again, there are no clear terms written in this legislation that President Obama signed that outline what propaganda is. This, in a way, is a way to indemnify uh, the, the State Department and other federal agencies against, you know, once stuff sort of leaks over into the United States, then they won't be held accountable for it. So, so this is just to make it easier for them to distribute this stuff across all, all platforms. I mean, I think it should be noted that the Pentagon itself, uh, the, the, there's what's usually in these defense bills called the propaganda, propaganda rider, which is supposed to uh, prevent the Pentagon from using this, uh, from using propaganda on the United States. Um, what shocks me is there is always now, this is the second sort of, uh, story that I've done over the past year, which deals with these sort of information operations that the government's running. And so much of the response from journalists, uh, I, I, oh, this is not a big deal. This is what the government should be doing, which I always find quite incredible. Now, let's be clear. This is being sold as countering propaganda. But how do you do that? After all, if government agencies put out information to the public for the sake of altering a point of view, isn't that the very definition of propaganda? In fact, that definition is this. Information, ideas, or rumors deliberately spread widely to help or harm a person, a group, a movement, an institution, a nation, etc. So this law essentially funds U.S. propaganda. But isn't that illegal? It was. But no, not anymore. Because three years ago, wrapped inside the 2013 NDAA was an amendment that removed the ban on the U.S. government creating propaganda and then showing it to U.S. citizens. That ban, by the way, had been in place since 1948. The 2013 amendment struck down a ban on domestic dissemination of propaganda material produced by the State Department and the Independent Broadcasting Board of Governors. It neutralized the smith munt Act of 1948 and the Foreign Relations Authorization Act in 1987 that had been passed to protect U.S. audiences from our own government's misinformation campaigns. And in 2013, when that bill was passed, most media said, oh, don't worry, the U.S. government will never actually create propaganda. Well, now they've created the mechanism 
to fund it. So what you need to know is that politicians claiming we need to fund U.S. government propaganda to protect the public from the Russians and from the Chinese. But there's a reason it was illegal for over 60 years for our government to propagandize the public, to protect the public from our own government. Reality check, right now, two out of every three Americans in the latest polls say they have little to no trust in mainstream American media because two thirds of Americans already believe that they're not getting the truth. That number will likely only get worse with the legalized American government propaganda. So what is the solution here? Well, how about media just tells the truth? just reports facts, does not act as an arm for political parties or for government institutions. If we want to combat propaganda, both foreign and domestic, then shouldn't we just inform the public rather than trying to control their views? That's Reality Check. Let's talk about it on Twitter. So the knowledge and understanding that's gained from studying criminology can be tested and applied in the real world. But as a practitioner, as a policymaker, as a stakeholder in the criminal justice system, and it's this real nature of criminology that makes it so exciting, makes it so engaging. Thirteen hours. Tomorrow morning, a new movie will debut about the incredible bravery of the men fighting for their lives in Benghazi and the politicians that abandoned them. It's the true life story of a group of elite former military operatives stationed at a secret CIA base in Benghazi the night militants attacked. Tonight, the movie version of events already triggering fresh controversy from Hollywood to Washington and out on the campaign trail. And depending on whom you ask, it's either a tale of extraordinary heroics or another round of political crossfire. Compound in Benghazi. In Benghazi. In Benghazi. In Benghazi. It's a word that seems inescapable. What difference at this point does it make? This was a really heroic night. That's really it. heroic. I never knew that until I read the book and talked to these guys. In real life, the tragedy triggered massive investigations.
major motion picture about to be released by Paramount Pictures, 13 Hours, The Secret Soldiers of Benghazi makes it very clear that Benghazi was a pre-planned terrorist attack. The film is introduced as a true story. The film is told through the eyes of the men who were there, three of whom are with us tonight. The real-life heroes on the ground in Benghazi on September 11, 2012. They helped director Michael Bay craft a gripping film that captures the fierce fight to protect dozens of Americans and the desperate calls for help that went unanswered. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having us. I know two of you have seen the film. Mm -hmm. You have not. Nope. Uh, Tonto, let me start with you. Sure. How, how true to life is the film? Yeah, it, example, when I walked out of the theater after I saw it, I felt just drained. Like uh, there was a big hole inside me. The fact is, we had four dead Americans. Was it because of a protest, or was it because of guys out for a walk one night who decided they'd go kill some Americans? What difference at this point does it make? What's your response to her? It, it, it makes a huge difference. And that's, this is what Oz is talking about with the, the politics of it, the politicking of, and just getting it down into where it turns into a reality show, keeping the, the Kardashian type show where the truth is not being told. That's one of the reasons why we pushed us to go ahead and stay apolitical, but tell the truth of what happened on the ground, because it does matter. It matters to honor our friends that passed away. It matters because we need to honor Ambassador Stevens and Sean Smith, and to honor the families that need to know the truth of what took place there that night, because they didn't know. This year's nominees for Best Documentary Feature scoured the globe to bring light to stories that might have remained hidden by chance or by force. Their efforts uncovered hidden beauty, gave voice to the voiceless, and dared to speak powerful truths. Here are the nominees for Best Documentary Feature. Citizen Four, Laura Poitras, Mathilde Bonfoy, and Dirk Belutsky. problem is this sort of use of classification to hide things from the public that shouldn't be hidden from the public, and that's the, that's the issue. All right, the first up, she is a filmmaker whose latest documentary, Citizen Four, is nominated for an Oscar and premieres on HBO February 23rd. Laura Potras, hey! How you doing? Great to meet you. I'm a big admirer. Thank you. 
You're a very brave woman, and you deserve this Oscar. I think it's a fantastic movie. It's kind of a, a it's like a, a reality thriller. I mean, we see thrillers all the time in the movies, but this is a real one. This happens in real time. Citizen Four is Edward Snowden, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the story of him contacting me and sending me emails and us exchanging emails for many months and then meeting in Hong Kong uh, with Glenn Greenwald. Right, I mean, what we're seeing, I think people all remember from a couple of years ago when Edward Snowden was front page news, but, and Snowden said that, uh, you know, you wondered why he selected you. And he told you, well, really, the government selected you. That's because right. you had made films before that got on their radar. Right. And you were being harassed, right? Right, yeah. Harassed and pretty badly. It was pretty bad. I mean, I made a film about the Iraq war, and after I released that film, I started being stopped at the U.S. border. I was put on a secret watch list and um, was detained every time I returned to the United States, which happened over 40 times. Snowden wouldn't, I mean, nobody, people aren't, like lining up to become whistleblowers. What goes on in the hotel rooms, the meeting between you and Glenn Green, right, he involved Glenn Greenwald too. Mm -hmm. And I, I gotta say, I mean, you guys are just ballsy because you are hitting the biggest hornet's nest in the world, mm -hmm. the yeah. United States military industrial complex and living to tell about it. Yeah, I mean, actually, I didn't think I'd be sitting here to talk about Academy Award nomination. I thought right. a lot of other risks that we that we were facing before we went to Hong Kong. But, um, but you know, luckily, um, you know, things worked out. And, um, and so the, <laughs> the, the film tells a story about um, first my being contacted by Snowden and then, and then being in the hotel room. Most of the film happens in the hotel with, right. with Glenn. At Uh, my name is Ed Snowden. I'm uh, 29 years old. I work for Booz Allen Hamilton as an infrastructure analyst for NSA uh, in Hawaii. I, I think that the public is owed an explanation of the motivations behind the people who make these disclosures that are outside of the democratic model. I'm, I'm no different from anybody else. Uh, I don't have special skills. Uh, I, I'm just another guy who sits there day to day in the office, watches what happening, what's happening, and goes, this is something that's not our place to decide. The public needs to decide whether these programs and policies are right or wrong. And the Oscar goes to Citizen Four. Um, thank you so much to the Academy. Um, I'd like to first thank the documentary community. It's an incredible joy to work among people who support each other so deeply, risk so much, and do such incredible work. Um, we don't stand here alone. The work we do to, and that needs to be seen by the public is possible through the brave organizations that support us. We'd like to thank Radius, Participant, HBO, BritDoc, and the many, many, many organizations who had our back making this film. The disclosures that Edward Snowden reveals don't only expose a threat to our privacy, but to our democracy itself, when the most important decisions being made affect, affecting all of us are made in secret, we lose our ability to check the powers that control.